If you'll take your copy of the scripture and turn with me to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that is going to be our text this morning. And like Max said, it is such a joy to be able to preach through Advent. Uh, these are messages I look forward to every year. I mean, these messages uh, are, are so good, it makes a Georgia loss to Alabama just seem inconsequential. And I mean that in all seriousness. I mean, it's a game. Uh, and, and I rooted for my Bulldogs, and it didn't work out, and that's okay. Because I knew this morning I got to tell you about Jesus. And that is, that is the most important thing. You know, but one of the things that we're noticing in our world and in our society is that Christmas is becoming more and more of a secular holiday. It's it just, it's, it's losing the focus of Christ. And that's been happening for a long time. But a survey that was conducted last year by the Pew Research Center asked about belief in four of the main tenets of the Christmas story. They asked, do you believe that Jesus' birth was heralded by an angel, that Jesus was virgin born, that wise men were guided to Christ by a star, and that Jesus was placed in a manger after his birth? Only 57% of Americans believed all four of those things. And that is down from 65% just four years ago. We're losing it. Now, the researchers noticed uh, two factors that contributed to this trend. First of all, they said atheists and the religiously unaffiliated who are increasing in our uh, culture, they're even more unlikely now to not believe the story of Jesus' birth. And second, there was a small but significant decline of roughly 5% in the share of Christians who believe that the Christmas narrative contained in the Bible uh, is not true. There's a decline there. So both within and without the church, the belief in the Christmas story is becoming less and less. I loved how we saying in that very first uh, call to worship, we believe in the Christmas story. We do because it is true. Now, what's the alternative? If we're not going to believe in the Christmas story, then what do we believe? We believe then in a secular worldview, but that secular worldview doesn't offer us much, does it? I mean, if you ask those who are religiously unaffiliated or those who, who don't have a belief system of all uh, or atheists, uh, they'd say, oh, yes, 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 the, the secular worldview is a very satisfying worldview. But it really isn't when you get down to it. If you were to press them on some of the questions of life, they become more and more uncomfortable with the answers uh, that they have and, and, and the reliance they have on the twin gods of science and reason. Now, look, I, I love science. Science is great in its place. But in the end, science does not provide us with the answers that most of us require. The story of our origins and our end is unsatisfactory. When, when you ask science, how did it all begin? Science answers, probably by an accident. And if you ask them, how will it all end? Probably by an accident. Well, the accidental life is not worth living, is it? We don't live an accidental life. We live a life of purpose. We live a life that, that is here because God has created it and put it into place for his purposes. And the science God has no answer to the question, why are we here? And when you ask it, what moral instructions do you give us? The science God remains silent. But thankfully, you and I serve the one true God, the living God, the God who is worthy of our praise, who is worthy of our worship, and who is worthy of our lives, all of it. And one of the things I love about the Advent season is it causes us to slow down in the hecticness and the busyness of what this season has become. And it causes us to focus again on Christ because he is the reason why we celebrate. We focus on his first coming, that first advent 
of our Lord and Savior. And so as we move through the next few weeks, we're going to be thinking about the coming king, and we're going to be examining some Old Testament scriptures that prophesied about him and, and describe some different characteristics of who the king would be, who the Messiah would be. And so I pray that our thankfulness for God's grace uh, just grows and is expanded and that, that our longing for his second advent grows deeper as we study these passages. And so this morning we'll begin by, come, by, by examining how the coming king is the redeemer. And to see that, we go all the way back to the beginning. So will you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Moses writes, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truthfulness of it, for its inerrancy, for its infallibility, and Father, for its application to our life. I pray this morning that as we study this passage and we see Christ the Redeemer, I pray that we are uh, just more in awe of you, more in awe of, of your grace, and, and our thankfulness and our praise to you just grows more and more. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, I cannot help but to find it interesting that despite the overwhelming evidence for a world that is marred in every conceivable way by sin, that people still hold on to a naive belief that all people are basically good and that the world is getting better. I, have you, have you, ex I experienced this, especially around Christmas time and everybody, oh, everybody's just so good. They've got good hearts and they've got, you know, good intentions. And I look at the world and I see something different. I, I don't see people with good hearts. I see people with corrupt hearts, sinful hearts. I see people who are doing terrible things and they're pursuing their sinful desires with less and less restraint today. I see a world that is very much like we sang in, in O Holy Night. It's, it's been lying in, in sin and error for a long time. That's the world that we live in. But it's, it's interesting because as people continue to pursue those sinful desires that they have, they become increasingly blind to the results and, and their need of how bad the, the situation really is. You see, sin clouds our reason. And the more we allow sin to flourish in our lives, the more confused we become. And you don't need to look very far for evidence of that in our culture. It's happening all, the way, all around us. And the peculiar spiral is this, that there's, there's no recognition for the need of a redeemer because there's no recognition of of anything in us that needs redeeming. We think we're fine just as we are. And the more we become worse and worse, the more we allow our sinfulness to grow and grow, the less we see a need for the Redeemer. Do you see how that works? It's paradoxical, but that's how sin operates in our lives. It clouds our reason and it blinds us to our need for the Redeemer. Our culture seems to have wholeheartedly adopted the gospel of Oprah that essentially says, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. As long as you don't say that there's anything not okay with me. If you do that, then, then we're not okay anymore, right? That's not the truth. The simple fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, Satan, our enemy, is at work in this world. That's why we need a redeemer. And Satan has been at work in this world since the beginning. Our text this morning exists in a context, and we need to understand that. It's the story of creation, and, and it, it shows us our need for the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Genesis 1 and 2, it shows us this beautiful story of creation. Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, he gives us this beautiful description of how God created all that is seen and unseen in six days. We see the creation of light and darkness, of the earth, of all the animals, of all the plants, of, of mankind. We see all of that. 
And we see God placing those first human beings in the Garden of Eden in order to have communion with him, in order to have fellowship with him and to, to live there in paradise with him. They spoke directly to the sovereign creator. But when you read Genesis 1 and 2 and then you get to Genesis 3, you discover there's somebody else in the Garden of Eden as well. The serpent, Satan. Now, as we're reading the Genesis account, if we're going to be honest, we have to say, wait a minute, where'd he come from? And Genesis doesn't really tell us. It doesn't say that. For that, we have to look elsewhere in Scripture. And we see in passages in Isaiah and Ezekiel and some other books of Scripture that, that God had created the angels. And the, the chief of the angels was somebody named Lucifer, who was the, uh, just this beautiful, beautiful angel of light and whose job it was to, to direct the praise of the angels to God. But then, then Lucifer had pride build up in his, in his inner being. And he started to think some of that praise should be coming to me. And he says, I'm going to elevate my throne above the throne of the Most High. And somehow he convinced a third of the angels to go with him against Almighty God. If you've ever heard of a dumber strategy, I'd like to hear it. But that's about as dumb a strategy as you can come up with. But he does, and they're immediately cast down. Now, when exactly does that happen? We don't know. Scripture doesn't say expressly. What's important for us to know is that it did happen, and that Satan was in the garden, and Satan sees God create Adam out of the dust of the earth. And Satan probably didn't think too much of that because he'd seen God create the animals. He'd seen God create the plants. He'd seen all of this, okay? But God does something very special with this creation out of the dirt. He personally breathes life into it, and he puts his image on it. That's, that's unique unlike anything else in, in creation. And Satan, who hated God with seething hate, decided to destroy that first man and woman. And so he deceives Eve by causing her to question what God had plainly told her husband, Adam. And then both of them succumb to the, uh, to the serpent's temptation. They disobey God. And in that moment that Eve eats the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then turns and gives to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he also eats, we see the fall. The fall occurs. Sin corrupts the first man and woman, and then it begins to corrupt the remainder of creation. It's like a terrible ripple effect spreading out throughout the entire universe and throughout all of, all of creation, so much so that Paul would later say that all creation groans under the weight of the curse, under the weight of the curse of sin. The man and woman know right away that they're naked. They're not wearing any clothes, and so they start to fashion some things to cover themselves with out of leaves. And then when they hear God coming to talk to them, they try to hide from him. That's the second stupid strategy that we see here. You're going to hide from God. Now, of course, they fail. And when they're questioned by God, they try to deflect and they try to come up with excuses for why they sinned against him, why they disobeyed. And of course, just as with anything else, there is no excuse for disobedience to God. God is the king. We've sung that this morning. God is Lord. We've sung that this morning. And if he is, that means that his will is to be obeyed. His commandments are to be obeyed. There is no excuse for disobedience. Listen, Adam and Eve knew what God required of them, but they failed to keep it. They knew the consequence. They knew that death was the result, but they did it anyway. They had been created innocent and pure and blameless but now their natures were corrupted by sin. And because their nature was corrupted by sin, when they would have offspring, 
that would be imputed to the offspring. The sin nature would be passed on from generation to generation. You see, Scripture presents us uh, with the fact that Adam is our head. Adam is our representative. And in Adam, all are guilty. We all receive that sin nature. We all stand guilty before the Lord. So we need a Redeemer. Now, with the understanding of the context, we can turn our attention from the need for, a, for the Redeemer to the expectation of the Redeemer. And we see that here. God says that because of the serpent's deception, there would be enmity, hatred between him and the woman. You see, Satan's temptation of Eve was not because he hated her specifically. Satan's hatred of Eve was an outflowing of his hatred for God. He didn't necessarily hate Eve at that moment because he hated God. He just wanted to destroy what God had created. That was what he tried to do. And, and look, Eve wasn't even afraid of the serpent. If you had a talking snake come up to you, you would probably be a little concerned. But Eve had no concern there. There was nothing. She said, oh, okay, I'm just going to talk to this guy. There was no, there was no fear. There was no hatred here. But, but think about it. When Satan was cast out, when he rebelled and was cast out, he was condemned with no hope of redemption. You see, there is no hope of redemption for the angels. None. They can't believe the gospel and become saved. Those who rebelled are sentenced to hell. And so Satan naturally thought that if he could get these creatures that God had made to rebel, they'd face the same penalty, right? There would be no redemption. They would be falling and Satan would win one against God. That's what he was thinking. And so can you imagine how angry, how angry Satan must have been when God didn't just crush Adam and Eve in that moment, but instead gave the expectation of a redeemer who would come to make things right. Wow. That's what we see here. We see the expectation of the redeemer. We see it. Look, look again. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see, there's the promise of the redeemer who would come and destroy the serpent. Now, I want you to put yourself in Eve's place for just a moment. Eve's place here, Eve's expectation was probably a little bit different than what ours is today, many thousands of years later. Okay, Eve, Eve heard the curse, and she heard God say, your offspring, your seed. Well, we know from the rest of Genesis 3 that God expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, and he set them outside of it into a world that is marred by the curse, that is not going to be easy to work. It's going to put up thorns and thistles, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. It's going to be hard, and women are going to have pain in childbirth, and it's, it's just not going to be easy. There's going to be tension between men and women now. That's, that's all part of the curse, okay? We see all that there. But we also read in Genesis 4.1 that Eve conceives and bears a son who's named Cain. And that name's very important. Look in chapter 4, verses 1, because she explains why she named him Cain. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. That's very important. Who is coming to crush the head of the serpent? Her offspring. He. He. And so Eve says, I've got it. Can you imagine her as, she, as she's holding that infant Cain? Here's the offspring God promised. He's going to crush Satan. Oh, we're going to get back to the garden. We're going to be reunited in that fellowship that's been broken. Listen, we have just a taste of fellowship with God right now. And that's beautiful, isn't it? Those who are saved, you know what it's like to be in fellowship with God. But 
But that pales in comparison to what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden. But it's what we're going to have. We're going to have that again one day. But, but Adam and Eve longed for it again. That's what they wanted. They were striving for it. And she thought this was the offspring. But then that's not quite how it happened. You know, in Cain, Eve expected that that relationship would be restored. So you have to understand how crushing a blow it must have been when Cain murdered his brother Abel. You see, he was not the redeemer that God had promised, nor could he have been since he received the sin nature from his parents. He was the first person to receive that imputed sin nature. So while Eve's expectation was premature, God's promise had still been made. He promised that he would send the Redeemer and it would be kept in the most spectacular way imaginable. He would send his only begotten son, Jesus, to be the offspring of the woman in the fullness of time. And it's here in Genesis 3.15 that we see the gospel promise for the first time in all of Scripture. It's, that's why we call it the Proto-Evangelium. That's that great big uh, theological term for this morning, the Proto-Evangelium. The first, the first gospel, the first mention of the gospel here. It's not going to be the last time. Because as you move through the, through the Old Testament, you see over and over God continuing to promise that he would send his seed. He would send his redeemer. He would send his king, the Messiah. He was coming. Whether he's talking to Noah, talking to Abraham, talking to David, it doesn't matter. That is all there. You know, I, I'm amazed. Some people come to this passage and they try to explain it in a very naturalistic way. They say, well, this, this explains why human beings are, are typically afraid of snakes. It, it just, it's an evolutionary thing that we have received because of this. No, that's not it at all. This is something far greater than that. It is the establishment of God's promise to send the Redeemer who would defeat our enemy Satan in the most convincing manner possible. And God's people are expecting their Redeemer to come and deliver them from the bondage of sin and death, to deliver them from their enemy that we know as Satan, and they were looking for his advent. Praise God, from our point in history, we can look back and see that advent occurred about 2,000 years ago in a little town called Bethlehem. Now, not only does God promise the Redeemer in this passage, he also establishes the parameters by which the Redeemer would enter the world and the method by which he would deliver his people. You see, this is not an afterthought for God. This is not a, I got to do something in response to a crisis. Oh, the people failed. What am I going to do? This was not unforeseen by God. God had the plan in place from before creation existed. That's what we see in Ephesians chapter 1. Before the foundations of the earth, God had this plan. And he, he established this plan in eternity past in order that his immeasurable grace and his glory might be on display his plan was for the son to take flesh, to be born of the virgin in the most humble of circumstances, to live a perfect life that you and I could not, and then to go to the cross as the perfect unblemished sacrifice for our sins and be raised again on the third day in decisive defeat of sin and death. And what's more, what's so great about that? It's a free gift to all who would receive it in faith. A free gift. That's it. There's, there's, it's not based on anything that's worthy about you. It's not based on anything you can do to receive it. It is based fully upon the work of Christ and God's grace to us. And so the method that God established for the Redeemer draws a clear distinction between what's called the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. There's a difference here. You know, here, here we see, I, I don't think, 
I, see, I don't think we can understand God fully until we understand that he relates to us through covenants. That's what we see through the Old Testament, right? He makes covenants. When you come to Jesus, guess what? He makes a new covenant through the body and blood of Christ, a new covenant with us. But this first covenant, we find it here in Genesis 2 and 3. And it's true, the word covenant doesn't exist in this passage, but you can see the principles of the covenant fully. I'll tell you another word that doesn't exist in Genesis 2 and 3, sin. But sin exists there, doesn't it? Just because the word doesn't exist doesn't mean the concept doesn't exist here. A covenant is clearly in place right here. And in fact, later in Hosea 6, 7, uh, the prophet said, but like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. So Adam transgressed a covenant with God. It was a covenant of works. And we see that in, in chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Turn over there with me and you'll see this laid out. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work, and, work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. There's the covenant. You see the parties of the covenant are clear. It's God and it's Adam. You see that the terms are clear. Adam was to work in the garden and he could eat of anything in the garden except for the fruit of one tree, just one tree. And the consequences are clear. As long as Adam was obedient, he would have life. But if he was disobedient, the consequence was death. That is what we see here. But Adam and Eve chose to eat the forbidden fruit. And they violated the covenant. And they put an end to the covenant of works. There was, there was no way to make it possible to keep that. So what's the consequence? God said that, that in that day they would surely die. And if God would have destroyed Adam and Eve in that moment, he would have been right and just and holy to have done so. Would have been absolutely correct if he had done so. The first man and woman were not owed anything by God. They were not entitled to anything. They weren't even entitled to being created in the first place. So God owed them nothing here. In fact, they owed God everything. And indeed, that's what Satan was counting on. He clearly knew that God had commanded them not to eat of this tree or else death would come. And if you don't believe that Satan knew that, how was it that he tempted Eve? Did God actually say? Did he? I mean, yeah, I know what you were told. I know that. Yeah, but, but did he really say that? No, he, he, God didn't say you would really die. He, he's telling you not to do that because he knows that if you eat of this tree, you're going to become just like him. And you're going to know the difference between good and bad. You won't die. You'll become like God. That was the lie. And in his irrational hatred for God, Satan wanted to see that which God created destroyed. So you can imagine how enraged he was when instead of destruction, God responded in sovereign love and issued the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God sought them out. Did you know? I mean, it was right then. Look, look back just a few verses with me here in chapter 3, verses 6 through 8, and you'll see what I'm talking about. In verses 6 through 8, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Was God coming to destroy them? 
Was God coming as the judge to bring his wrath to completely consume Adam and Eve? No. No. Now, Adam and Eve were afraid because they knew the consequence. Of course they hid from God. Now, they made an excuse. Well, we're naked and we didn't want you to see us. God created them naked. They'd been walking around naked in the Garden of Eden all this time. They'd been walking with God naked. It wasn't that they were naked that they were afraid. They knew the consequence. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And this is in a time when there was no death. They were afraid. But God was not coming to destroy them. He was coming to demonstrate his sovereign love and grace. He was coming to tell them what we've already seen, that he would send the Redeemer, and not just anyone, but his own Son. And anyone who would receive the Son in faith would be brought into the covenant of grace that God has established here. Not a covenant based on our works, but on Jesus' completed work. Every covenant that God has made with his people points to Jesus Christ, including this one. Hallelujah for the free grace of God. Hallelujah. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake, the free grace of God is costly. You see... Jesus emptied himself, as Paul would tell the Philippians. He took the form of a servant, and being he was born in the likeness of men. And on the cross, Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, second person of the Trinity, fully God and fully man, was made sin, even though he knew no sin. And when he was made sin, the full wrath of God, every drop of it, was poured out on him on the cross. Listen, we can't understand fully how that worked. But I can tell you that it was anguish like no one has ever experienced. It was unbelievable what Jesus endured for us. He was the only one who could. And he stood in our place and he paid our debt in full so that we might be made his righteousness. You see, the grace of God is free to receive, but don't mistake that with the idea that his grace didn't cost anything. It cost the Redeemer everything. It was a costly grace, but it was the price he was willing to pay for our redemption and for our ransom. And it was all because of his sovereign love and grace. Now, I know that there are some people who dislike the idea of speaking of Christ's death at Christmas time. They say, Pastor, isn't that an Easter message? Aren't we supposed to be celebrating the baby in the manger right now, not, not Jesus on the cross? Uh, you know, can't, can't we just focus on that? Well, you know, I have to tell you about the death on the cross. I have to tell you about what happened at Easter because that was the whole point of Christmas. That was the whole reason Jesus came. He came to die. That is it. When you look in, in the gospel, you will not find Jesus say anywhere, remember my birth. He says, remember my death and resurrection. Listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. I love to celebrate Christmas. But we celebrate Christmas looking to the cross. Because that's the whole point of the incarnation. That's the whole point of God taking on flesh. He came to die. He came for the purpose of the crucifixion and the resurrection. So how in the world can we separate them? We can't present only part of the gospel. We must present the gospel in full. Because part of the gospel will send you to hell. The full gospel is what saves. That is the power of God unto salvation. It's the unfolding story of redemption that's presented in the scripture. It reveals the victory of the Redeemer. I love the way that W.A. Criswell, that great Baptist preacher of the 20th century, put it. He said there's a scarlet thread of redemption running from Genesis to Revelation. A scarlet thread, and you can follow it the whole way. It starts right here. 
It starts right here, Genesis 3, 15. And you can follow it all the way to Revelation 22. It's in every book. It's everywhere. It's that scarlet thread. You see, God is orchestrating history. He's weaving that scarlet thread all the way through history as only the sovereign God can in order to bring us to the incarnation of Jesus Christ, in order to bring us to Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. And it all has its beginning right here, where the Redeemer is not only promised, but his victory is assured. Now, I want you to see there's, a, there's an apparent defeat of the Redeemer here. It says his heel will be bruised. This is a temporary defeat. This is temporary here. Have you ever had a bruised heel? Have you ever had a, a bone spur in your foot or maybe a, an Achilles tendon that's been pulled or something like that? That's, that's awful, isn't it? It hurts. And, and when you've got a bruised heel, how does walking feel? Not good. It hurts. You know, you limp along. You might have to have crutches. You might be off your feet for a little while. But is a bruised heel fatal? I've never heard of anybody dying from a bruised heel. That's not a fatal wound. Uncomfortable? Yes. Inconvenient? Yes. Fatal? No. And on Good Friday, when those Roman soldiers were nailing Jesus to the cross... And they were nailing that, that spike through Jesus' feet, through his heel. Satan thought he had won. He had succeeded in killing God. That's what he thought. Good Friday, there was celebration among the demons and among Satan. You can almost hear them hooping and hollering there at the foot of the cross. That celebration changes in a few days, doesn't it? It changes to howls of defeat because Satan's victory was nothing more than a bruised heel for the Redeemer. Jesus' victory, on the other hand, is the ultimate victory. He crushes the head of the old serpent, the, the offspring of the woman, Jesus Christ. And please don't miss the reference to the virgin birth here. The seed of the woman, that's very, very clear. It's the virgin birth. Jesus would crush the head of Satan. And that assurance of ultimate victory would be used by Jesus, by Paul, and by John to encourage the church in the New Testament. In Luke 10, 19, Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. In Romans 16, 19, Paul, in the closing of that great book, says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And then finally, John, writing in the book of Revelation, he speaks of that fearsome red dragon. And in chapter 12, verse 9, that, that old serpent had, had manifested into a great fearsome red dragon in Revelation but I want you to see in Revelation 20, 7 through 10, what happens. And when the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had received them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is ultimate victory. That is what is awaiting Satan because the Redeemer will crush his head. That's what's waiting on Satan. That's what's happening there. And that ultimate victory, won by the Redeemer Jesus Christ, is offered to you this morning by our gracious God. Our Redeemer, who crushes the serpent's head, who died for you, he offers this grace freely and openly to all who would receive it in faith. And so this morning as we close, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior... Listen, you're going to side with somebody. If you choose not to follow Christ, you choose to follow Satan. 
And you've already heard what the end is going to be for him. But Christ has won your victory. He's won your redemption. He's won your reconciliation with God if you will receive it in faith. And so as we sing our closing hymn this morning, I'll be right down here at the, at the front row. Come down and talk to me. Let me introduce Jesus to you. Let me tell you about his wonderful, sovereign love and grace. And we will rejoice with all of heaven over the lost one who's been found. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you. Thank you so much for sending the Redeemer. Thank you, Father, that, that there is no power on earth, no power in the spiritual realm that can overcome him. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the grace that we have through him, for the salvation that you offer us through him. And I know that there are many who get upset that, that we say that Jesus is the only way and they look at you, Father, as some kind of moral monster because you only offered one way. But as we've seen this morning, you didn't even have to offer that. Grace is the fact that you offered us a way, that you made a way through Jesus Christ. So, Father, may we proclaim that. May we announce it to this world who is lost because it is the only hope there is under heaven for salvation. We thank you for this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.